Thank you, choir. Thank you, praise team, accompanists for leading us. Am I on? It scared me last time I started talking up here. About three voices started coming after me. Look, I see a clock up here. You know what that means for a Baptist preacher? Nothing. But it sure looks good setting up here. And look, I was having some battery issues with my microphone, and I think, I think they're trying to t uh, give me a hint. Got a case of them up here. We appreciate you being here. I, I never forget, I preached one time at uh, a church in North Mississippi, and I walked up there, and I, I looked in the back in the behind the balcony on the back wall. And I, I'm not exaggerating here. You know, preachers can't exaggerate a little bit, but back on that wall was a clock about two feet by three feet, a digital clock. It was the biggest digital clock I've ever seen in my life. And so, you know, me being from Ole Miss, I, I sort of put two or two together. I said, undoubtedly, y'all had a problem with that before about preachers going long. So I, I'll try not to go long, and I'll try to get you out of here in time to, to beat the Methodist to lunch. Is that a deal? If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. We're going to get there in just a minute. It's so good to have a lot of my family with here uh, here with us this morning. And it's, it's good. they're sitting back there on the next to the last row back there. They're not a pulpit committee, by the way, so you don't have to worry about that. But uh, that is a lot of my family back there. I appreciate that. My, my brothers and sisters and my daughter and my wife are all sitting back together, and, and it's good to have them. See, we grew up in a home that was a lot of sports fans. Any of y'all ever grew up in a home like that? I know Coach Stanley, and I was, had an opportunity to watch Brad Clymer play a lot of basketball growing up in, in high school and in, in the community college. And, and uh, we love sports. My dad never missed a game. That we played, and I don't, I don't think I ever remember him missing one of my games. I, even when I was in college, I played uh, some tournament softball and traveled, and I'll never forget, it was 8 o'clock, State Park in Morton, Mississippi. I let off the game, and I looked over. My dad was the only person sitting in the stands watching me play as a college student, and I, and I still remember that. It still sticks out in my heart. But there was no bigger sports fan than my mom. My mom was a mess. I mean, she passed away about, uh, about eight years ago, but she absolutely loved sports. Even, even in her latter days, she would be watching NBA games in the nursing home. She, she loved sports, but that's the family we grew up in. You know, and there's some good things sports can teach you. And there's some bad things sports can teach you. I know we've got some coaches here, some former coaches here, and some great coaches and great Sports can teach you a lot about life and how to live life. Sports in the right setting can do that. There, there are many athletic metaphors and stories in the Bible, and Paul loved to use those stories. And this story we're looking about today is one of those athletic stories, and he talks about a foot race in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. Notice what he says, not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? May God speak through your word. God, you promised that your word would not re return void. God, there's power in your word. And God, I pray that you speak through your word. Not through me, but God, you would speak through your word. God, what a privilege it is to stand in this pulpit today in this great church and proclaim your word. And Father, I pray that our hearts should be receptive, even mine, for what you would have us to learn today, what you would teach us today. Speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, what a privilege it is to share about this passage, some of my favorite passages of Scripture in the, in the entire Bible. It starts out, and I, basically I want to, it's, it's going to be real simple. I'm going to walk through this pretty much word for word 
Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. I just want to walk through this and, and see if it speaks to you the same way God spoke to me. It says, not that I, and the I is Paul. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. Who was Paul? Well, we know who Paul was. Saul was the guy that was going on the Damascus Road and was blinded by the light and forever changed. Here was a guy that went from persecuting, severely persecuting believers to passionately pursuing Christ. He completely did a 180. Here was a guy that was giving Christians a hard time one day, blinded by the light on the Damascus Road, went from Saul to Paul that wrote over half of the New Testament that you're holding in your hands today. He was radically changed. Paul was. So Paul wrote this uh, verse of scripture here in Philippians. And then he says, he says, already. Notice the word already. It says not perfect. And he was teaching against, against the false teaching or perfectionism. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, one of my favorite passages of scripture. You can just jot it down. But it says a lot. It's been one of my life verses. Because it talks about this. About not being able and not reaching perfection. Being confident in this very thing. That he who what? Began a good work in, in me will carry it on to what? To completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Completion. Perfectionism. You ever notice that person that thought they were perfect? Let me go and just tell you right now. No nudging your husband. No doing this. No pointing at people. No, uh, Wednesday night, I shared a couple of stories, and I had this lady doing like this to her husband. I'm like, look, don't do that, okay? Don't be doing that. So don't be pointing at people. But you know how it is. Some people, they think they are perfect. I'll never forget Don Wilton. He's a pastor of First Baptist Church, Spartanburg, South Carolina. And he was teaching at a pastor's conference. One of the funniest things I've ever seen is I saw him mimic preachers. Don Wilton, a pastor mimicking his own kind, pastors. And he basically talked about how pastors enter the room. Now, I don't know what your, 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 your favorite sports fan was or whoever you look at, but you know that, but he, I will never forget what, the swag that he walked in when he walked into that room, that pastor that walked in. That they, you know, they, they had that strut. I know this is a bad illustration, but Ric Flair comes to my mind. And some of y'all are like, who in the world is he talking about? Probably Ric Flair has never been mentioned in the pulpit of First Baptist Church Florence. But Ric Flair loved to strut. He was a wrestler, by the way. Don't go look that up. He's not a great example in any way. But he strutted. And then, and then, because see, somebody already told me not to holler. But he, ho he had this famous holler. And I'm not going to do that. Because a couple of uh, folks already told me back there, don't be hollering this morning. They're going to try to take a nap. So, <laughs> but that's the way Ric Flair would do. He would strut in. But notice what he said. I, I've obtained. Obtained. You know, what, you know how that is, teenager. When you obtain that driver's permit. Or you obtain finally get that driver's license. And, and teenagers, you know why they post pic your pictures on Facebook, your parents do? Well, we'll stay off the road when you get on the road because we know who you are. But I obtained this. What did he attain? He said, I obtained all of this. All of what? Well, look just a couple of verses back over and you'll see what he obtained. In verse 7 through 10, it says, But whatever remains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. This is Paul speaking. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them, what? Garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that is which, that is which through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to what? I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his suffering, but becoming like him even 
in his death. And he goes on. I've attained, and not that I've arrived. Again, have you ever met somebody that felt like and thought like they, they had already arrived? Full of ego and arrogance. Let me, let me ask you to do something. I don't care if you're a child or a senior adult. Take your hands like this. Cup your hands. and a blow on them. What'd you feel? Did you feel breath? That means you're all still alive. So you have not arrived yet. You're, you're still on this side of heaven, okay? You get that? There will be a day, one day, then you will arrive. And that's when you have no more breath. And that's immediately when you get to go in the presence of the Lord. He says, but my goal is this. My, Paul's goal is this. I want to know Christ. I want to be more like him. Not, not just about him, but to really know him. I want to know him deeply. So how do you do that? You have to press on is what he says. He says it twice in his, in his scripture. Press on. We must press on and push ourselves and others to run. Press on means this, to run, to follow after. It will not always be easy. It will not always be easy. I did a funeral this past Friday for someone that lived a tough life. And it was not always easy. It's not always easy for us to passionately pursue Christ. And notice what he says, to take hold of that. To take hold of that. You know, again, I'm just a country boy. That's, that's what I am. I've, I've had the opportunity to serve in some great churches, some larger churches, but I'm still a country boy at heart. I love to hunt, and I love to fish. And to some of you may be able to understand that, uh, we used to go trot lining. And we, we run trot lines. And it, run, if you run trot lines in the middle of the night, it was, it was always interesting because if you're running that line, this is, this is my illustration of this about taking hold of. When I would run that trot line in the middle of the night, you would feel a, a, a tug on that line. And there was nothing better than that tug on that line because you know what that meant? There was eventually going to be a fish. And you would just run that line, that tug would get greater and greater and greater. You know, that fish was not mine until I what? I laid my hands on that fish, and then I put him in that boat. And that's what it, that's what it means there, to obtain, to take hold of that, to seize, to finally catch that. That, that tug never came mine until I, I took hold of it. I took hold of it. Take hold of what? Christ Jesus. Folks, we try to take hold of a lot of things. We try, we try to put our hands on. We try to take hold of a lot of things. But let me remind you, the only thing that will ever, ever totally satisfy you is Jesus. It is not a drink. It is not a relationship. It is not a pill. It is none of those. The only thing that we should take hold of that will ever totally satisfy us is Christ Jesus. I love what John Piper said, a quote. I put this on Facebook this past week. And God just really, I mean, he has really caused me to wrestle with this quote. He says, if you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Your soul is stuffed with small things, and there is no room for the great. You know, and God, I'm telling you, God has just really spoke to my heart about that this week, about nibbling so long at the table of the world. I don't know what that looks like for you. But you, you put small things in your heart and you, in your life. You know, and, and one of the things that, that God just really spoke to me about, convicted me about, was about TV. I love to watch sports. I love to watch TV. And God just says, you've been nibbling too long there. 
He said, just turn it off. So I haven't had my TV on in about four days. And for, for those of you that know me, that is a, a big thing. I, I just said, if that's what it is, God, I've been nibbling too long at that table. I, I just want to take a break from it. Where there will be room for the great. Sometimes we, we put all the small rocks in there. We don't have room for what? The big rocks. The things that are most important. And he says that the things that took hold of me. Let me remind you that Jesus took hold of us first. He went after Paul. He went after Paul, and he comes after you and me. It still blows my mind that the God above, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, chose me. And he personally came after Mike Brister. He personally ran me down. As a junior in college, I ran for him, and I ran for him, and I ran from him. You know what, though? He never gave up. He personally came after me. And he wants to take hold of you. He wants to come after you. It says brothers and sisters. It's a term of endearment. Brethren, speaking of believers, the body of Christ. <laughs> I, I love what he says, consider myself yet. The key word there is yet. I have not arrived. <laughs> you have not arrived. You have not completely attained, but I'm going to keep on running. <laughs> Are you going to keep on running? Are you going to keep on going after him? Are you going to continue to run the race? But here's, the, I think, the most important part of this passage today. For me, and hopefully it will be that for you today. But one thing I do. But one thing I do. I truly believe this is the word God gave me for this church today. His church. One thing. David Platt says, some translations do say, but one thing I do. David Platt says, the, the original Greek says, it just says one thing. Not one of many. One. What is that for you? He says, forgetting. Here comes the hard part. Something we can't do, but he can. We might be able to forgive, but it is so, why is it so, so hard for us to what? To forget. Sometimes we can forgive, but we want to hold on to. We want to hold on to that grudge. We want to hold on to that thought. And it's so hard to forget that. Especially when, we, when we've been what? When we've been hurt deeply. It's hard to forget that. It is hard to forget that. To let go of that. Forgetting what? What is behind. The past. You know folks, our past can be good and bad. And sometimes it is, our past is this. It is a good past. Some of us, it is. It, the, the good part of our past is this. I have a perfect, I have a string of perfect attendance pins here. I, I've been, I've done well. I've been good. I haven't missed church in so long. I've done well. And we have that haughty attitude, almost like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and says, look, look at me. I, I, look at all that I've done spiritually. Look at me. And that's that part of our past that is a good past. But it's almost a haughty type attitude. But the other past is this. It's a sordid past. It's a bad past. And it is so difficult to forget that. It is so difficult to walk through that and to walk away from that past. Because the devil is a liar. He is a deceiver. And he will constantly, what? Remind us of our past. Doesn't he do that? May I ask you this? When he reminds you of your past, would you remind him of his future? Just remind him of his future. Say, you don't have any control over me. Let me remind you of your future. Your future is not good, my friend. What is behind the past? I, it, and, 
We must acknowledge the past, but don't live in it. You can never, you can never go through today without going through yesterday. But we cannot live in yesterday. I think that's the, the word that the, that the Lord has laid on my heart for the church. The church in general. This church and the church, the big, the big K church, the big kingdom church. Definitely not a, a great character person here, but I'll never forget when Rick Patino went to coach the Boston Celtics. And I used to love the Boston Celtics. I, Larry Bird was one of my favorite players of all time. But when Rick Patino went to coach them, he, he shut the locker room door, coach a lot. And you had that talk before. I'll never forget one of my favorite, uh, I was coaching, I was a chaplain at Pearl High School. And I'm not going to share a whole lot about this, but we were playing an inner city school, and Coach Bruce Merchant, Bruce Merchant was the head coach. And uh, we should have been beating the school really bad at halftime. And I'll never forget. <laughs> I was walking to the dressing room like I always did as a chaplain, and I had this hand, big old hand, I <laughs> put on my shoulder. And he said, Brother Mike, you're going to need to set this one out. And I looked up at him and I said, yes, sir. But this is what Rick Patino said. He said, Larry Bird is never going to walk through that door again. Kevin McHale will never walk through that door to, again. Robert Parrish will never walk through that door again. You've got to forget that past. And that's what he told, he, that's what he told the new Boston Celtics. Those guys are not going to walk through that door. So we must embrace the presence and we must move on. And the word he uses there, he says straining. It's a close-up of a runner straining. His vein, have you ever seen that picture of his veins and his muscles? Where is he straining? Towards. We must always move the ball forward to what is ahead, it said. The focus and concentration there was, if you remember the story of Peter walking on the water. Jesus was walking on the water and he says, and Peter says, Jesus, that is you, bid me to come to you on the water. And Peter got out of the boat and he did fine until he what? He took his eyes off of Jesus. He lost his focus. He turned to the side and he saw the winds. He saw the storm. It's so easy to do that. Well, we must press on. He says it again. It's a marathon, not a sprint. It's a race of endurance and perseverance. Don't quit. If, if you only hear anything I say, don't quit. Don't give up. Rick Warren said this, when the, past, the pastor at Saddleback who wrote The Purpose Driven Life, he said this. He said, have you ever felt like quitting as a pastor? He said, yeah, about every other Monday. About every other Monday. Don't quit. Keep on. Press on, toward, towards. <laughs> I, 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 have, I do have a little mischievous side to me. No amens back there, family. But i never forget, I, I was, when I was at First Baptist Jackson serving as a student pastor there, I, I had one responsibility. And, and they were running a 5K. You know what my responsibility was? I, I, don't, I, I think that I just knew my intelligence. All I had to do was stand there with an arrow. The error, it was a directional error. That's all I did, which means go this way. That's all I did, the entire 5K. I'm like, come on now. And there and there. But you know what my mischievous self wanted to do? Especially when I saw a couple of the people that I really, oh, I better not say that. We're in church. Didn't care a whole lot for. I wanted to I just send a couple of them that way. I mean, that's just my mischievous self coming out of me. None of y'all probably ever had that. But he said, his, Paul said his goal was to win the prize. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 says that prize is an imperishable prize. It doesn't go away. That God has called me. Notice what it says. God has called me. Not just the hired guns and the ministers, but all. God, God called all of us as ministers. Where? Heavenward. Heavenward. That's where he called us. It's an old song. 
I started to get Tim to sing it, and I know he could have it. Dude could sing anything. But it says, I bowed on my knees and cried holy. I want to close with this song. It said, I dreamed of a city called glory, so bright and so fair. When I entered the gates, I cried holy. The angels all met me there. They carried me from mansion to mansion, and oh, the sights I saw. But I said, I want to see who? Jesus, the one who died for all. Then I bowed on my knees and I cried, holy, holy, holy. I clapped my hands and sang glory, glory to the Son of God. I bowed on my knees and cried, holy, holy, holy. Then I clapped my hands and sang glory, glory to the Son of God. And I love this part. As I entered the gates of that city, my loved ones all knew me well. They took me down the streets of heaven. Such scenes were many to tell. I saw Abraham. I saw Isaac. And I saw Jacob. I talked with Mark and Timothy. But I can you just imagine this. I saw all those people. He saw all those people. But he said, I looked, <laughs> and there was who? Jesus. And he says, I want to see who? Jesus. When I was pastor in Wildwood, there was an older lady that was getting to her very end. Her daughter called me over and says, Mike, you need to come over and see my mom. I'll never forget this. I walked into her room. She had her eyes closed. She opened up her eyes and saw her pastor. She grabbed my hand, and she closed her eyes, and immediately, at that moment, went to be with Jesus. She was waiting to see her pastor. But more than that, she knew when she closed her eyes, she was going to see who? Jesus. Reminds me of my visit with Oy Johnson the other day, and Francis Tucker. And just a great talk I had with those, those two precious saints. And Oy told me, he says, Mike, he said, as long as I can walk, as long as I can continue to, to breathe, I'm going to still try to help teach my Sunday school class. That spoke to my heart. Because he continues to press on. He continues to run the race. Individually, let me ask you this question as we wrap it up. Can we press on? Individually. Can you press on? Can you forget what's in the past? Can you move towards the goal to be more like Christ? Can you strain towards that goal? Now, what about his bride? What about the church? Can we, as a church, forget what happened in the past? Can we embrace the presence and can we strain and press on towards the goal to be more like Christ. That is my challenge to us as individually, but also to us as a church. Can we press on? Can we continue to run the race? And can you come to that place in your life? Such a great passage of Scripture says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race, and I kept the faith. Would you pray with me? God, what a privilege it is to stand here today. God, I just pray for these folks here today. God, if, if there's someone here today that needs to make the decision to follow you, I pray that they would come. Our, our pastors will be down front. And God, if you speak to their heart, God, I just, whatever decision, God, if you, or you just spoke to them and said, if they need to come to this altar and say, God, that's me. I've been too much thinking about the past. I've been holding grudges. I've been holding on to junk. God, help me to forget that and help me to move on, to move towards you. Help me to press on and strain towards the goal to be more like you. God, whatever decision needs to be made, God, I pray that you help us do that today. As we sing, you stand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.